4, 3, 2, 1. Bom dia, boa tarde. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening to all of you. I am William de Castro. I'm a master's uh, researcher in the Pós-Afro UFPA, and I'm here to greet you in this first session of the mini course, Epidemics and Pandemics, Past and Present. This is part of the second cycle of lives, or the, the second, 22nd uh, doctoral school, Fabrica de Ideas. This is a very intensive school that annually is part of the calendar of uh, Brazilian, African countries and the world researchers, researchers. This is happening always Tuesday and Thursday at 10 a.m. in by Brazilian time. And we have included over 30 professors of a doctorate. Fabrica de, de Ideas carries out this event in partnership with the Federal University of Bahia in both in the graduation program in the ethnic and African studies and the anthropology studies as well. And also the university, the State University of Campinas through their graduation program in public policies, the Federal University of Maranhão and the Africa Multiple Cluster of Excellence. Universita Bayerus. So we thank you all. We have the support of the University of uh, uh, Cape Verde, uh, the Dean of Extension of the Federal State of ba uh, University of Bahia, Federal University of Bahia, the Brazilian Association of Anthropology, the National Association of Graduation and Research in Social Sciences, as well as the Brazilian Association of Political Science and the Brazilian Society of Sociology. This event is being uh, possible by the AGS uh, communication, AGS in nine communication diversity and graciously, graciously translated by our dear professor, um, Paula Santos, English and Portuguese. I need to inform you that uh, we, do, we require a presence of 75% of the course to get the certificate. And please put your questions and your provocations in the chat. And we think that uh, not generalist, but possibilities of real changes to think about this complex team. This is our first activity of the mini course and we have two others yet in, in this session, in this epidemics and pandemics, past and present, few African cases is going to be taught by Professor Dr. Valdemir Zamparoni and debated by Professor Dr. Fabio Baqueira. I thank you all for the presence, for sharing your time and your knowledge, you know, to think together about this drastic moment of the history of this planet. I want to apologize for uh, our little delay. We have a little technical uh, problem. I want to invite Professor Dr. Valdemir Zamparoni, has his undergrad in history by the State University of Sao Paulo and doctorate in the same university and postdoctorate by the University of Lisbon. Uh, currently is a retired professor, but he acts in the uh, graduation program in history and a multidisciplinary graduation program in ethnic and African studies and uh, both in the Federal University of Bahia. He is a professor in master's course in the history of Africa and Angola and uh, the University of Agostinho Neto. And he is a doctorate professor in African contemporary history in the Pedagogic University of Mozambique. And he is member of, uh, he is part of the editorial council of many 
uh, magazines. He is a referee at ARC for, for some agencies funding uh, scholarship agencies. He has experience in the areas of history, anthropology, theory, and methodology of investigate of research with emphasis in African studies, acting particularly in the themes Africa, Angola, Mozambique, colonialism, racism, gender ideology. Be very welcome. Thank you to all people present in this first class. Once more, I want to thank for the invitation and this opportunity. I want to register that I'm not a great specialist in this issues of pandemics, but I have been studying it because I'm uh, studying, I'm working with healing, healing practices and the advances of uh, biomedicine in uh, African studies. When this uh, team in the Fabrica de Ideas came, it interested me, at least if not as a professor or but at least as participant, we have participated in many round tables and conferences that show the importance and the complexity of the treatment of dealing with this team. Just going back a little bit, but before I wanted to thank Fabio that's going to be our main interlocutor. I would like to do as, as a little introduction uh, there was a class or a conference that Fabrica did a few months ago when I did a presentation, a very generic uh, in, in the idea of introduction conference. I don't know if some of you had the possibility of uh, watching. I think this is, is going to be published very soon, a book that includes several of these classes and this presentation that I did. In this first class, I wanted to discuss what was the conception of epidemics and pandemic. I wanna make a distinction in both. The World Health Organization de define pandemic as the something that is global. That's the name pan. So it's technical geographic pandemics involves the world. But I would like to discuss that in fact, I consider that the some epidemics are also pandemics. Uh, Epsis means local, so it would be just localized in one place. We have to discuss the conception of the world because for some society, particularly in the past, their world was the territory, not just a geographical territory, but cultural territory with its language, its values, what def defined for them what was the world and their way of interpreting the world. So the condition of the disease for that society was a disease for the world, for their world. So the pandemic, the technical definition of pandemic of being what in globes includes all the world is has to be adjusted two places where the world, the conception of the world does not go beyond the borders. Uh, particularly the human societies that live it isolated. But what was common that very few people in that society had contact with the other. So they define their world in uh, against the world of their neighbors who had other cultural practices or other languages, etc. So the identities were built and their vision of the world 
in it did not mean that it went beyond their cultural and maybe geographical borders. So this debate uh, between culture uh, borders is very complicated. The European uh, community shows very well that there are cultures and identities, cultures and identities in, in, the, in a way that uh, the political border does not uh, include the cultures that are contained there. I think that the great difference for those who want to understand the social dimension of the diseases, I think the most important differentiation is about endemic and epidemics. Endemics are the diseases. We understand there uh, as diseases that it has a long history within that society and along the time this society is able to create mechanisms of management of that disease, either through mechanisms that could be directly a, a therapy or looking, searching for symbolic mechanisms or in the dimension of the spiritual or the emotional, where these diseases is already part of the life or the cultural and mental universe of these peoples in a way that their, this occurrence does not, is, is strange for them. Although it may cause uh, suffering, but people have the, the management of this disease already in their culture, the, the ways of confronting it, the healing practices, etc. The epidemic would be opposite to the endemic. Epidemic is something that uh, appears in uh, uh, not expected, not explained, violent, very, very little. And then it is understood as something that's not in the universe of the understanding of that society is something invisible that comes destroying that, that uh, people have no perspective, no knowledge to confront that that's new, uh, unknown, um, little and with a short duration. It comes, it comes in a very intense way, destroys a lot in a very intense way and then disappears and then maybe return. So when it, it, when it returns, that uh, there's some understanding because of the first occurrence. But in general, that doesn't happen. For example, we have in the African case, we have the smallpox that is a, a millenary disease in the African continent, continent but people this not, uh, people have, uh, have uh, uh, defined or developed practices of how to deal with that, with um, sanitary barriers, isolation, but the smallpox, although it causes a lot of suffering, does not cause a violent impact, not in the little or the death, because they have the management techniques, but not, also not a, a major impact in the emotion or the symbolic for the people. Said that in these three classes, we are going to talk equally what is pandemic and epidemics. This is going to be clear in the second, the third class, because in this first class, we are only talk about one big epidemic 
in the global sense, which is big and recurrent along the centuries. And I, I have mentioned in the first lecture that the black, black dirt, black death, black plague, and have uh, have acquired a global character in this geographical sense. I'm going to show you a few slides. And I would like to, you know, call your attention. This was, uh, was a representation done in the following century of the Black Death. And this is a theme, something that has been discussed here. These are three elements in this image that are very first. You see that the, the, the death has cards cards in their hands. The idea of the cards are where you may have luck or not. So in the, the houses in the left that are not wealth, the death, the fortune and the castles, the great cities and, and the wealth. I think the most important is the representation of what is death are two elements that are present here that, that is recurrent in other universes, including in the Islamic world. See that the death has a, 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 a bow in the back. You know? So it's interesting, the association of arrow and death, arrow and sin. You are going to see this later in other situations and uh, including in the Islamic world. And the other thing, the death has wings of um, a bat. So it's, not, it's curious that this association of a, a, a bat and a pandemic and that we have been discussing with the COVID-19 a discussion that if the epidemic was uh, transmitted from a bat to the humans. So I wanna show you the global character of this epidemic. If you can see here in green, the routes of commerce existing in the 14th and 15th century. So different from the Atlantic Ocean, we didn't, have a commerce route, which is only going to start in the second half of the 15th century. In the 14th century, these routes are very intense already in this part of the world. And this image shows that the, the way or that the Black Death has has uh, taken. It's established that also starts in China, but it is expanded. This gives a more broad vision, but I'm going to, to show you a more precise thing. In this green arrow, that is a very intense commerce. You see the islands of Indonesia, the Bay of Bengal, the Bengal Bay, going around all of uh, this coast of India, all India being this here, this, uh, this connection to the Gulf that the old, old Mesopotamia, that is the, the delta of the the rivers Euphrates and uh, Tigre. This is the silk route that's very generic, but that was 
so we can see this map shows us that's not one only uh, route that is not uh, uh, a road like we think today. So the same thing help, uh, happens here. There are sea routes that is interconnected with land routes. So here shows how many places were affected by the epidemics of the Black Death, Black Plague. You see 1331. See, we hear 1349, 1349, in a very short time, 18 years. That today looks like a long time, but it was, it was not because, the, uh, so the idea the caravan left uh, the China in the Silk Route and arrived in, uh, Europe. So a caravan would j just go to a certain uh, position and then uh, commerce, made a commerce there, and then other merchants would follow, not the same one that left China. And the same thing, it happened with the ocean uh, routes. Although some other diseases were brought to Africa a little earlier, but this shows the the route the east route and you can see the areas in green it was the most affected by the by the black death but you can see that this does not translate correct does not translate it correctly this eclosion of the disease until um, 1330s, 1340s, 1350s, but it was much bigger in the following century. Here, another way that to show how the bubonic plague, uh, not the, the Black Plague, uh, established. There's not a very precise study of how this. Oh, there's a, there's a microphone open that's created. There is a lot of echo. Please turn off the microphones. We don't know where it's coming from. There are possibilities that the, the disease came in the east coast of uh, Africa, but in the north coast was through the Mediterranean way, the Egyptian Cairo was very affected, Tunisia, and even though Morocco and Gambia and Senegal, but in the East Coast was very early affected by those commercial routes that connected the, the East to the Red Sea. So the coast of Africa that this uh, uh, coast, it shows until Mogadishu, but it affected to the very south until uh, what was called the Lagoa Bay, which is the Bay of Lorenzo Marques, that there was not such a regular commerce, but uh, here is Zanzibar in this universe that includes the Pacific Islands, the coast of Kenya and Tanzania. Tanzania and the north of Mozambique. It was part of a cultural universe called Swahili, uh, connect to the Oman Caliphate. That is here. And therefore, in the Arabic Peninsula, and there were commercial routes. And these commercial routes brought the plague. I would like to return to introduce another. A little bit of the history of the plague. The identification that the plague was transmitted by a specific uh, um, 
Bacilo that happened in uh, uh, when it happened, uh, the outbreak in Hong Kong by two researchers, uh, a Swiss, uh, a, Su a Swiss and uh, and a Japanese uh, group that has identified other bacillus that were able to isolate the bacillus and uh, uh, create a vaccine against the bubonic plague. The bubonic plague was uh, scientifically named as Yersinia pest because uh, they were one Swiss and one Japanese. So the Japanese does not name the bacillus, although Kitazaki was a protege of uh, Koch, it, uh, um, because it had to be the European, this is a cultural ideological, uh, it would be the European that would have the fame of have discovered the bacillus. That's why they did not name the, the with the name of the Japanese probably. But in the 20th century, there was uh, a discuss between what would be the Black Death and the bubonic plague. These arguments points out that the Black Death was much more infectious than the bubonic one, and it killed and spread faster. And this uh, speed that we see between 13 uh, uh, 20, you know, in 20 years, it goes through all this university from the East Pacific all the way to, to Great Britain. This would be inconsistent with the biology and the behavior, both of the rats and the fleas. The bacillus is is uh, transmitted by the fleas and originally by the black rat. That is, is this black rat is was resistant to the disease. And uh, according to some uh, researchers, the transmission to the humans has to do with the increase and increase in the increase of ag agricultural area in what was the forest areas before. And therefore, the, the contact of the humans with the rat. So the rats are living more and more with the humans and having the opportunity to, to, to transmit. The black rat does not exist in the Western world. So it's something that uh, does not go beyond the middle, uh, middle Asia, but, uh, but also the, the gray red is also a transmitter. The ones that, uh, the argument that are, that say that what was the, the bubonic plague Oh, that happened in the in the 14th century, the 15th centuries in the in Europe it was much close to the Ebola virus that has been discovered in the 20th century, which is a very little capacity of uh, spreading very very fast. But anyhow, what is dominant in the historiography? of the virology and the medical one that the bubonic plague and the black death or the black plague are the same and the black uh, plague of 14th and 15th century was the most lasting and more although it we talk about 14th and 15th century it has other occurrences and uh, we had a uh, first one in the in the center six 
uh, after Christ, when the and has disseminated in, in the Mediterranean to today's Istanbul, and then it went to the Mediterranean and to the Red Sea. So it, it affected the heart of Europe, the Germanic kingdoms, and also the Red Sea, the coast of uh, Arabic Peninsula and Cairo, and some regions of the eastern coast of Africa. The hypothesis in the 20th century that was that China was not the origin, but the Great Lakes were the origin as the main focus or the origin. They were they are here in Uganda, the Great Lakes in the Rwanda, Uganda, in this region, and would have disseminated from this area. This thesis with a report that Roberto uh, Popkins had uh, written in, in the 19th century, but this hypothesis was also discharged because researchers about uh, phylogenetic uh, evolution of the bacillus done through the DNA by the um, Max Planck Institute. It confirms that China was the origin and the, all the variants that are found in the world that are four or five are also found in China in greater quantity than other places. So the variants that derive from that original are spread in the world, but it says that, that they, they came to Africa not through the Silk Route by the, by the, by this Sanghe, the Chinese uh, commander in 1309, 1343, that uh, did here in this world. That's no guarantee that came with the trips of the voyage of Hamze or came of China. You have to remind you that these are not like the current trips. They are not, uh, they are business one. You stop in this, you dock in this, in this harbor, you you uh, make uh, you do your business. You receive water. You receive food. So the rats, both they go in the ship and they leave the ship with the merchandise. So there is a hypothesis that it doesn't make much a difference if it came by that uh, by that red one that I showed before or this commercial routes. But what is Right. It seems that is accepted that it came from from China. You know, with this uh, this introduction, I would like to talk a little bit about the Islamic world past. It's known as Taun, and uh, the pestilence that is the is called waba it was in in the text islamic text that says talks about the 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 speed of the death by the same cause among men defined as something that that uh, affects the natural uh, substance of the air so, so this is a theory that the, you know, we have to think that the work of Hippocrates and Galino was translated to the Arabic and uh, has uh, affected or influenced a lot of, uh, of uh, particular the miasmas, you know, is accepted in the Islamic world. Granada, Granada, in Cordoba, 
e uh, ele nesse grande livro que vira o grande in livro this great book of the islamic world about medicine he accepted this thesis about the miasmas miasmas there is a narrative also done by uh, oh, lembros from Andalusia. I think uh, you uh, until 1498. I have to rem uh, remind you that Granada was a city under the Islamic world, and all the Iberic uh, Iberian Peninsula was also under the the Islamic um, rule, and uh, he wrote in 1348, he said, this plague is for the Muslims, um, 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 a reward and a pain. And for the non-believers is the people, the believers who are affected by the, the plague are martyrs. So if somebody says uh, that plague is destruction, say, God create and recreates, and people uh, insist. I say that the prophet and who infected the first. And in fact, the, uh, the Quran, uh, Mahomet says that, says that diseases are divine wills who infected can be he uh, he decide he does not deny that it can be transmitted by human but the first cause the first infected is a virus there is a theology debate that has involved the islamic world in the 14th century that uh, that would be the action of the genes the geniuses. So the the core. So in the book of the core, uh, there is the recognition of it, the existence of the geniuses, uh, which some uh, there are spiritual entities with some power in, in some territories, particularly the desert, and they would be. They would be act, they would have acted in in their own initiative. So some theologians says that the genes uh, acted by their own choice, and some uh, would say that they would uh, do by divine divine decision, or some saying by spirit, Satan spirits. So. Uh, the, the, what they should do was prayers, uh, cite the core, and uh, give uh, give uh, to the poor. Let's say, uh, I don't know if you heard about Batuta, who went uh, uh, thousands of kilometers around the world. He says that in 1348, in the Gaza city, he found the city almost desert, deserted, deserted because in uh, in the previous year he was informed by the governor of the city that in the previous year they had a hundred and one thousand and one hundred people die daily in the Islamic world. Uh, side of the theolo theologians that had this this uh, orientations to to give to the poor to recite the core to uh, pray there was also there were others like sheikhs who were also the guardians of the principles of the islam in a practice that was called the wise women that they were People would come to them to, to get treatment when there were diseases that the doctor could the doctors admitted that they could not treat. And among those the mental diseases and what what they call debilitating diseases. 
So the sheikhs also uh, recite some uh, parts of the core that are very important, powerful, more powerful than others to the to the to the confrontation of the disease. Uh, also, the medicinal uh, phytotherapic herbs, etc. But but also more important that I want to think is was the use of the word, because this is very African too. The creative power of the word is also in the Bible. God has spoken and and as he spoke, created the world, create the world. So he did not take tools to create the world. He used the word. So the method that was used by the, the uh, wise women were sac sacred words. That was, these words come from the Quran, but it, they were written in the in the dough of the bread and people would eat those bread or they would use this in the paper with ink that was washed and drunk by the by the sick people the same practice the same practice it was found in the tables uh, found here in bahia with the Malays, this was, uh, Richard was pioneer in discovering this tabuing, these little tables. The idea that, that you wrote some prayers, you, you wrote with the rice flour, washed, and it was uh, drunk these words with the power, with the magic uh, power. So that was also in the 14th century. Uh, people wrote their secret letters that was put on the top of the doors uh, uh, as protection or the practice of, of, of drinking the water of this ring that was written a prayer and then in the, put the ring in the water and that got the healing, the healing power of it. There was another theologian and doctor from Andalusia. He said the following, the medications based in the faith uh, practiced by the healers of the village. And, he would say the powers contained in the formulas of protection and cure is superior to the power of the medication, neutralizing the power of mortal poison. He admitted that as a doctor and a theologian. I'm calling this attention because as the disease, and you, you don't know how it comes, is invisible, is intangible comes from the supernatural. Of course, the healing that invokes over supernatural powers is also a, a cure that ha has much more respectability and has more potency, more power in the therapeutic universe because it deals with the intangible the invisible universe, the material can get efficacy if it is uh, blessed with the spiritual power. We are seeing this uh, in a very dirty way by some of our pastors of this universal church, this evangelical church selling water and uh, flowers and rings that are blessed by them, but they are using the same narrative that uh, COVID is a divine punishment to the uh, human sins and the cure is in their hands. 
and they can give in exchange for some money, not little money. So the COVID would be cured by this object or, and by these elements that are materials, elements, but they would be, uh, they would contain power once they would be blessed by them. It's also curious that the medical uh, school of Andalusia, it was very heretic from the point of view of Islam. Two great doctors, Ibu Kachima and Al Katibi, they define it clearly in the 14th century that the plague that they were confronting, it was a result of the interhuman contagious. There was not a legal process, but they both accused of heresy. And in uh, 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 gave up, but the other one uh, has challenged the thought of Mahomet, Mahomet that said that this was a divine uh, transmission, divine uh, punishment. So Ibi Katima in that century, he gives some counsels that are very interesting that we are going to find later in the 19th century in a study that one of my students, the students that I advise, Diogo Lessa, is studying about the ICLAN, the possibility of the Europeans to, uh, to get uh, acclimated to, for the colonialism. Keep your air around you pure and sweet, perform it with fragrance. Uh, sleep with an open, open, with the room open, with open windows, with the north wind. Keep, keep the body calm. So this is the idea that, uh, and don't breathe very deeply. So it's the idea that the, the disease comes comes through the air and if you breathe deeply you are taking it deeply as well and read and read calming texts particularly the quran so there are many passages of the quran that is not uh, calming ones like the bible too and it, your diet avoid eating old meat but eat black bread regularly. Don't drink any wine, not, not even mix it with water. The Islamic, the Islamic law allows drinking the, the wine, mix it with the water. And it's permitted, the, you know, you decide what amount of wine you put in the water or the water put in the wine and empty regularly your your intestines and uh, and and you can see that this is is the influence of the ayurvedic medicine which comes from india it's important how these medicines interpenetrating each other all of this uh, up to here we talked a little bit about how the disease arrives uh, where it arrives from but let's talk a little bit about the impact first impact is immaterial there is a major impact because the explanations about the disease are interrogations, are questions. Why? What did we do to deserve this? There are texts. They are claiming to God. They are appealing to God, both in the Islamic world in other words, but people are asking for God mercy and asking God why 
God is sending us such punishment. There are no, there are lots of explanation, wars, conflicts, greed, etc., etc. Theoretically, each one finds a, a motivation, but all of them think that is is a divine punishment. So this relationship with the uh, is uh, this will change. It changes according. I start receiving in the WhatsApp not only good morning. That was good morning. Oh, good morning with a little flowers and a happy week. I also noticed that I was getting a lot of messages from people that I never thought being so religious. And they were sending me religious messages. Good morning, may Lord protect you. May Jesus be with you this week. And the threat of a disgrace is deeply connected, even though today that we know the origin of the disease in the physical and bacteriological uh, sense, in these moments of a crisis, there is a growing convergence to the universe of the sacred. I'm not criticized, I'm just uh, commenting. There's an English historian that he studied the plague in Germany that said in these occasions, there's always a, some kind of a, a dramaturgy there is a kind of repetition of certain practices of certain narratives. And this dramaturgy is a good word because it's a universe that although they are very specific situation, they look like that they repeat. Anyway, the impacts are what I said, entire villages disappeared. We have to remember that all over the world in the 14th century, the cities could be big, could be big cities. Cairo was a huge city, Pekin was a huge city. Huge, not in the proportions that we have today. It was huge, but one million inhabitants as maximum a night or 90 some percent of the population was rural population so the supposedly the the, the countryside would be less affected but that would not happen there is a disappearance you know uh, the unpopulation so people uh some also in the city, it, the population has decreased because people went to the countryside to to escape from the from the plague. Uh, but this was affecting the countryside as well with the lack of hands to produce um, merchandise and food and all of that. Uh, the the items become very expensive, very rare. So there is hunger. The hunger is spread, and therefore the disease is also aggravated. So the pers the people becoming weaker because of the lack of food, you know, are more affected. For example, Tunisia that was an exported of cereals to the Mediterranean world in in this the end of this century imports. Uh, wheat and cereals from Sicily, where the impact was a little smaller. From the Islamic world, uh, the historian says that the most significant impact was in Cairo and Egypt because of the sophisticated system of uh, uh, 
irrigation that, uh, you know, um, demanded, you know, labor force, human labor force. So it was a, a fact that there are reports that the ch channels were abandoned and the vegetation took over. And so for you to have an idea in Cairo, there is a ref Cairo was in the 14th century, the biggest city at west of China, at west of Peking, of Beijing, and has lost in the 15th century in another wave of the plague. So in two years, uh, Cairo uh, lost 100,000 people, just the city of Cairo. That was the second biggest city after after Beijing. We don't have images from this in the in the Islamic world. In in the Islamic world, is a taboo representation of humans, even if they are dead. We don't have an iconography of the disease in the Islamic world. But one of the impacts is the abandonment of the funeral rites, because the the death is so immense that happens. What is, uh, has happened in COVID in some place, like here in Manaus, in Peru, that the families that had no way to bury them in the case of Peru, they put in the caskets and put on the street asking or waiting that the government would give some uh, some uh, dignified and into that casket. And now the more clear example is in India. So the in, Hinduist, Hinduist uh, uh, practice to, of incineration, there is an obstacle because there's no physical space, there's no wood, there's a inflation on the cost of the, of the wood. And the people who are the incinerators, yeah, these incinerators come from a specific caste, so the price has uh, risen. So the the the, the poorest families, these incineration sites of the Ganges River that you would receive the, the, the ashes of the person that has been incinerated. But with this problem, with the, the poorest people were just throwing the bodies of their dear uh, families in the in the river so the indian uh authority they create barriers in many many points of the river to avoid like uh to avoid they did a physical intervention to avoid that the bodies would would go with the river to other places so there's a narrative that I'm going to read in the middle 15th century about the Nile. When the pestilence has spread in Cairo with a great fury, the, the ritual costumes have disappeared, the caskets have disappeared, and even the, the mortalias, the, the fabrics were reused, the bodies were put nude without any protection that were uh, bodies, cadavers spread in the streets and alleys. People would throw their uh, their cadavers in the in the in the in the trash and riv and the Nile became a uh, uh, Nile became a slow route for the swollen and floating floating bodies that were uh, caught and they were 
uh, rottening in the in the midday sun. So this narrative, you can see how this was impact the impact of this in all the dimensions of the social life and the immature life. There is a theologian from Egypt that said, also a doctor, he says that there are positive results as well of the plague. Uh, and I have uh, highlighted this because among the benefits are the remotion of the hopes and the improvement of the land of the uh, works of the humans. It uh, awake men for preparing for their final journey, prepare for the death, and uh, also also ask for a third party to, to raise their kids. You you also say you know uh, goodbyes. Another one finishes some of their work, and another one reconcile with their enemies and the others deal with their friends that they didn't talk much with the kindness. One is very generous. Another re makes re uh, have the friendship of those who betrayed. Some uh, free the, the slaves. So this plague has captured all people. And there's no protection against it, except their uh, mercy, except uh, uh, salute to Allah. This has uh, been very, very normal in this uh, epidemic, uh, this new epidemic of Brazil, that in this normal would be a change of behavior uh, increase of solidarity, more better relations of humans among themselves and with the nature. Once more, I say historians don't like this com comparative history because, but there are elements that I think that are typical and uh, uh, that points out to some similarities in this kind of situation. You can see that what he is writing in 1348, they are all attitudes of change of uh, individual behavior and the impact of the disease. You may you you re-establish the friendship with those that betrayed you. That's your worst enemy. You are. It is an alteration of the behavior. Richard Evans, that I said about uh, the name of the person who talked about the dramaturgy that happens in this epidemic situation. I think I have, uh, I think I have another half an hour. It's a little less. <laughs> Let's talk a little bit about Europe, about Europe, particularly after the great plague that affects the Europe in the years of 1340s and 1350, but the great iconography is the next century. Uh, and I'm going to show this image that is the explanation of the Europeans and the results. With the Europeans also, they have the same kinds of explanation that we see in the Islamic world world is a uh, divine punishment for for the for the sin the apocalypse was very the part in the bible it was like the plague was the 
realization of the biblical words of the capitalism in Europe as well as in, in the Islamic world. World, there is a explanation that comes from the astrology as well. The astronomy as it was very developed, very advanced in the Islamic world, and that helped to to uh, orient the behavior of the people and the Europeans do, did not have the domination of the astronomy, but they were strong with the astrology. <laughs> and this is very curious. <laughs> and also I see now with the COVID, many explanation of uh, in the astrological uh, world. In the medieval Europe, it involved what uh, a country, uh, a country, no, a planet that was very feared. That is the that was Saturn. And I, I always, I never understood where, why, uh, why Saturn is so feared. I don't know if there is because of the uh, disease that is caused by uh, lead poison, but the Europeans. Uh, a little different from Islam, associated the disease to the ocean. There was in Europe a movement uh, uh, of uh, refusal to eat something that comes from the oceans, from the seas. Uh, because, uh, or not just products from the sea, but also that it was brought through with the boats, you know, because these boats would have uh, navigated those. So this thesis of the miasmas or the poison air was also very well accepted in Europe. But it, different from the, the Islamic world, it was uh, related to exotic reptiles, particularly snakes. So Davilon wrote in 1348, the previous year, the certain province of uh, the East suffered three days of calamities that uh, Terrorized the countries. The first day, it rained frogs, scorpions, snakes, etc. Other contemporary uh, writers talks about the rain of fires and poison creatures like uh, scorpions and snakes, and that would have occurred also in some place from the east. The idea that the, the evil came from the East, we have to remember that the Christians were in dispute with the Arabic for the conquest of the, the uh, Holy Land, which in fact was the, the conquest quest of the routes of the commerce. It was suggest that reptiles was causava doença. Na mente medieval, isso é muito interessante, cobras, serpentes, dragões místicos, em geral eram intercambiáveis, ou seja, a simbologia desses animais, tá certo? Lembrando, eu gostaria de lembrar que dragão é caracterizado pelo hálito não só quente, mas venenoso e pestilento. Tá certo? Mas é uma contradição muito interessante, é, porque é, é, na mesma Europa que via esses animais com perigos, e tem aí um princípio que, de certa maneira, se aproxima com a homeopatia, a, é, é, que você faz, e até hoje é assim com as vacinas, você faz do perigo o um remédio. Então, as vacinas... É, 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 como chama de picadas de cobra, como ele chama, antiofídicas, são produzidas com venenos dos ofídeos. 
E é curioso, essa noção não é nova, tá certo? Na Europa, se usava um medicamento... It used in Europe a medication called pediatric that was uh, some kind of a preparation that was uh, poison from uh, snakes and then you would produce something and it was considered the most valuable medications of all and curiously interestingly enough this medication was imported from china in particular where uh, in chinese medicine some of these ingredients are still present in medication in medicine it was a remedy in order to have people to reject the poison that got into their souls it was considered since diseases were considered uh, something that was imposed by god as a punishment for sin poison associated to these reptiles the therapy then was a way out acceptable for the minds of those people. We should not forget that in a very strong association between sin and snakes, the devil and the evil, a snake that has forced, uh, that convinced uh, Adam and Eve to eat the apple in paradise and they are expelled and then we lost what paradise was offering us and we fell into this universe. We should also know that snakes are associated to death and they are a symbol of the professions of physician that they are then intercrossed these mythical elements along history and even in contemporary days. So this dimension, I would like to speak about the impact we have in Europe. And obviously we have an impact in terms of necessary to be reminded that it's very clear in statistics, in statistics, particularly more precisely in France, and what would be later Germany demonstrates that around 50% of all impoverished people died with this pestilence of the 14th century. And for the wealthy, 25% of the population. So imagine 50% of the population dying would be like 100 million people dying in a very short period of time. So just imagine what that means. But the notion of the uh, divine origin is also not the only one in Europe. The image that you see here, the notion that diseases were always transmitted by foreigners. And then foreigners is very curious that they poison the water, they poison the wells. Minorities, in popular minorities, deviant minorities, and gypsies and Jewish, and a practice of a small minority, around 5% of the community, five, the practice of Kabbalah, which was an exclusive practice of Jewish and 
common Jewish people didn't have access to this culture of Kabbalah, which is a culture that is more mythical and secret. It raised the practice of Kabbalah was a black uh, magic or witchcraft. So if Jewish were already persecuted in the past, uh, this then there was a Jewish hunt because they were accused of poisoning the wells and a ball, ball with a mixture that was once again, you see, of snakes and lizards and spiders and in some of the circumstances using pieces of the hearts of uh, this poisoning. There are several elements, obviously, above all, in, uh, over, under torture of Jewish people who confirmed that they had poisoned well in several of the spaces where they went. It's important to remember that it was in the century that Europe comes into this witch hunt. The Inquisition is a part of this movement of persecution of, of minorities. It was a body of uh, groups that were persecuted and burned, and so that Christianism could be unified and under the command of Rome. So this is then something that happens in the 15th century. I don't have the exact date in the practice of burning Jewish people. And as you may realize, these are Jewish people who are being burned alive. It's interesting to observe that. The descriptions are horrendous, but this was a practice that took over many cities, oftentimes soldiers didn't want to do that because some Jewish people were funding the state and they were business people. However, fake news, I would say, projected in the past confirmed that Jewish people were responsible for so judeus só os ciganos também aconteceu isso tá certo e, e várias pessoas é, que, que, que supostamente eram inimigas né, foram de alguém de alguém era o pode uh, were also burned. Then I'm going to project a representation of the 20th century of London streets that are practically fires all over the city. They had these fires. The fire then burned the pestilence out of the air. So then if these environments are, are polluted, the figure represented here was in charge of the public power that went for the street uh, with a little bell, uh, something similar to a lockdown. Está escrito, é, nós, and I see here é, that tem a piedade, God é, desta, desta casa. has a piety or be merciful to the It's written there as well. People wrote messages in this temple 
and across the four protests and also to demonstrate that they were not Jews, they were Christians. I see another representation. If we read here the sentence, it's something that is recurrent. This notion that requests for country people stay away, not here. I follow and we follow and we die. The richest people who may run away are trying to run away and the impoverished people. This is a narrative that is contained in the representations of past events. The notion is that past events is going to be a, um, an equalizer, if you will. In Uzinga, a philosopher who talked about the autumn of the Middle Ages, that being only to stand in public in Brazil in 2010, which means that we have an interesting reading in terms of the meaning of these images, which is the dance of death. So this is a representation that is associated to the pestilence. So this bird that they represented, but the notion that they would have drained the cloth here and it put uh, substances that would purify the air. And that's a representation in Germany. And that's another representation of that time. I don't have the exact You see these people here who has a sport. This representation of that talking about the amount of sick people that seen is here. Theoretically, we have a physician who has a product in order to suit the disease. This is a very recurring representation. And the notion of were dying all over the street, wherever they were, left at their own devices. And here, we have something very interesting, a representation that is not very common. And the narratives in these representations, the notion of the representation of 19, Sorry, 1439 in Germany. And you see that domestic animals. It's very interesting. Of striking humanity. It's another argument that reinforces the, end of the narrative about the end of time and self-flagellation, the notion that if you were to punish yourself due to your sins and the mistakes you made, God is going to forgive you and therefore free you from the past. That show uh, the Europeans flogging themselves. 
clearly then we see the amount of copies and then you have people who are digging and making copies expressing that it was possible the, of, of the bubonic technique is going to lead to these circumstances então, assim, já uma outra gravura. There is this other um, picture showing in London, around London, the cards, as the text says, full of dead to bury. And you can see here, and this next image that uh, will show that people were buried in collective uh, places and in layers. You know, you can see in the left image people with the, the head in one side, the head on the other side, one over the other. See, this image is an excavation done maybe two decades Ago, next to a convent in England. These are uh, people who died with the Black Plague. And uh, we can see how it was. This has a major impact in the society. These are paintings that represent this idea of the death. We always say the bad news, you know, comes galloping. So, so the, the idea that the death was a night that would come in a very, uh, in a way that we're killing everybody with no, no mercy, no pity. We can see angels, Jesus uh, at the back, all the Christianity, see, the poor and the peasants are on the left the nobles with the musicians, everybody is affected by the disease. Here are, is the representation of a Moor in this idea. This representation in medieval, European. Once more, I call your attention. The, the death with an arrow and bow. One thing that uh, with, uh, we talked about the Islamic world that the genes uh, attacked the people with uh, arrows, so they would be poison uh, arrows. This idea is also recurrent here in the Christian world. And to conclude, as I had promised, this is the interpretation, is an image that uh, there are several versions of this, that's the death dance, the death festival. See here that the person here, his insides are, see in all ways, you know, playing music, some of the representations that I found were not too good, that this flute is, would not be a regular uh, flute, but a bone of, of the leg. So this was very recurrent in Europe 15th century. This motivation, this death dance and its representations <laughs> were very expressive. Uh, and one of the favorites of the literature of the painting of the following century, of this uh, plague of the 14th century. Zinga that I just quote said that the death dance in some representation brings along the Pope, the emperor, the religious, the child, 
all the professions and social positions. It shows the representation of social equality that is uh, made through the death and uh, projected the society's pessimism, loss of uh, culture, incapable of control and, and confront the realities of life. Uh, there's another research of the Black Plague. The Black Plague consolidated in the Western world the idea of blame and sin. So this death and this ritual is, it would be the ritualization of an extravagant blame and imaginaries of uh, life marked by the, the, the death. So all, all the ritualization, some people say that uh, of the macabre, people say that the Christianity becomes more personal, but at the same time, and the Protestantism also comes around this time. So, so it's not the Catholic Christianity, it's the individual Christianity uh, for each one. The idea of contagious, of the danger of the others become very strong in Europe in the following century. But at the same time, there's a set of practices that grow, that is the ritualization of the death uh, that has been studied already here in Bahia and very, very big rituals, very beautiful, very lasting practices of, uh, of uh, having, you know, order masses for 40 years, let's say once a year. People would make these donations to the church, so the churches would. Uh, and the book that he mentioned is the, the the Death is a Party by João Reis. And Europe, the impact of this was not small. I meant that it was not a small effect. When you imagine that 50% of the population dies, die without uh, understandable cause, what this, what they impact in all levels, the economic dimension, the dispopulation of the space, they say that in England, There was a valorization of the peasants, of the servants, that they start to have more guarantees and more, more uh, receive more from their masters because there was a rare labor. So there was a change in the in the servers. Uh, um, relationship, so some things were more verticalized, of course, but it is not a difficult to imagine that the death of half or 30% or 40% of the population that was not that dense is very significant. The very significant impact because if we think in the in the universe of the material conditions of the existence, but also on the ways that people start to relate to the world, how they relate to each other in the world, and also in the way that they relate to the sacred, to the divine. So I'm closing here in the next class. Uh, we are going to try to see a little bit the impact of other diseases, particularly in the African continent. And we are going to talk particularly about the cholera and maybe some others. 
if I have the time to systematize it in a way I would like to talk about others like uh, uh, yellow fever and a few other diseases, but I'll leave that for, for the Thursday class. I just want to thank your presence and the message that is given not through me, but, but this lady that's next to me. Thank you, Professor. Now we are going to have a short, uh, short break. Five minutes for Professor Fabio to start his debate. So we are back at uh, 12.03.
Bem, amigos da Rede Fábrica, voltamos. Uh, well, we are back. Agora vamos dar seguimento, né? Let's continue to our first section of the mini course. And uh, I invite here Professor Dr. Fábio Baqueira that has from the Federal University of Bahia, he has his undergrad and his doctorate in, uh, in history and uh, ethnic studies. And uh, currently he's a professor of the Institute of Humanity and Letters from the Unilab, the University of the Afro-Brazilian Lusophony, as is also a permanent professor of the graduation program in ethnic and African studies from the Federal University in Bahia has experience in the coordination of documentation center and memory and bits and um, libraries, experience in research of archives in Brazil, Angola, Portugal, and US. There, his interests concentrate in the independences in the constructions of the African contemporary African nations. Thank you, William, for the presentation. I also thank Professor Zamparoni for the first of the three classes that I think, uh, I believe are going to be very interesting. This one was already for us to have a more, a deeper uh, understanding of the process, or a reflection about the processes that are we are living now. Some people already have uh, seen some similarities we have a very short time because we have a technical problem in the beginning. I'm going to ask initially. There was one question that Professor Zamparoni has answered because he is going to to deal. He is going to respond in the next classes. I don't think that we have questions in the chat. I don't know if the team saw one at the YouTube. I would like to do a small provocation in relationship to the today's class. I was asking, I was thinking Zampa and how you have uh, through the, the works of Islamic doctors and then the European icono iconography about the plague, how how in the contact um, uh, between these two cultural spaces that are at the same time competing and exchange information, how we are going to have a theory of the contagious. So you say contagious first as uh, the air, etc. But then later, the contagious as being from the foreign person and through images that connect the East to, to poisonous uh, animals that brings. And also you talk about, uh, geographically talk about the South, the, the good North wind and not the South wind. So I would like for you to talk a little bit more about this the evolution of the, the construction of the theory of the contagious that later with the, my, the biomedicine are going to change, but it is going to keep a, a symbolic content that is still present. I think that's very clear that the world is very connected, that it circulates people with a larger or more or less intensity and also ideas circulate. The medicine to just to, to be an example, the Greek or Roman, Greek Roman medicine practically disappears in the high middle age, but it's translated in the antiquity to the to the Arabic and is going to be reintroduced in the Western Europe as an Islamic tradition. It's very curious this this route this way. 
a medical practice that were from the uh, old antique Egypt, the school, the school of uh, medicine in Alexandria, before Alexandria being a, a, a Greek city, it was Egypt, Egyptian Greek. All the schools of the pharaonic Egypt, all this pharaonic uh, medical tradition from Egypt, it goes through the Mediterranean, re-read, I think Mar Martin Bernal is a pioneer in the, 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 his book, Black Athens, Black Athens is, it talks how the black, the blackness of a, a, a Athens goes to the Mediterranean where it uh, is the Greek thought disappears from Europe, is incorporated to the Islamic world and goes back to Europe through the Islamic world. So uh, although you have this dispute, it's good not to forget that the Islamic universe is multicultural in this sense. It is a religion that creates a unification having the Arabic, Arabic as the cult language, the, the language of the transmission of the knowledge and the Quran. So we have the extreme East, for example, people. So uh, we have uh, problems that comes from the, we have India becomes Islamic and all the knowledge of the Ayurvedic medicine that was there before the Islamism is incorporated as well. The contact that the Muslim has have with the, the Muslim, with the African practices of healing. So they incorporated from the, the extreme East, from India, from Africa. So the great caliphate of Baghdad has universities. And before also in the uh, Persian, university that reunite, brings together with wise uh, people from the world. It doesn't matter which race in, uh, in or which nation, if that they have, the person has that wisdom, it needs to be bring in. The same thing happens to the Iberian Peninsula, Cordoba becomes a great center of thought and intellectual production and medicine. I mentioned two doctors from Andalusia, Spain, that it was a very heterodox uh, in a relationship to the Islamic orthodoxy. So the Islamic world, there's only one thing that united them is the uh, religious, religious relationship with the Quran and, uh, and in the and the Arabic language. So it's very multicultural. And this multiculturality uh, is also, of course, expressed in, the, in all the incorporation of practices, not just of uh, foods, but also healing practices. The idea that the air is, is uh, a bad air, a poison air, that this is present in the pharaonic medicine. The idea that is necessary to dry the swamps is also present in, in the pharaonic Egypt, uh, that the, the swamps are uh, origin of the disease. But uh, they knew that the malaria was transmitted 
they didn't know where and how, but they knew people closer to the swamps were more affected. So the idea of the transmission, the contagious, but they knew it was by the air. And this is transferred for the Hellenic, um, to Galen and Hippocrates medicine. This, Avicenna incorporates in that in their famous uh, history of medicine. I think there is a move that is now available in Netflix that's called uh, uh, is about this Christian that goes to this school of medicine. So this universe is interpenetrated, inter connected, the idea of the air contagious, airborne disease. And then later, the idea goes to the foreigner. And this idea is also in the interior of Africa as well, in many ways, in a very more, much more rigid way. We were living well. And then it, a caravan passed by here and brought the disease. They don't know how did this disease arrived. They only know that we're after the caravan passed. So we know that the foreigner is dangerous. So the, the contagious is present. The theory of the contagious is practically or becomes practically a universal theory in the African territories as well. You probably read that the idea that in certain moments of spiritual instability, when uh, it, it, when it dies, a spiritual leader, the territory is closer to the transit of foreigners, uh, literally. Europeans have reported that in the late 19th century, since they were not part of that uh, cultural universe, uh, they were being minus valued by the, the savage. You know. But they know that in a certain moment, there's something that brings the disease. And there in some cases is carried out uh, through the idea of the foreigner or airborne or through the air. The idea that the winds and uh, uh, all a habit that it is from Andalusia that is almost uh, heretical in relationship to the Islamic orthodoxy. So the air being air mourn or being, uh, or the miasmas of being the north wind, the south wind. There are several winds according to where the individual is located or the foreigners bring these problems with uh, hidden intentions that it can be. So now that we see that here in Brazil that also the this uh, idiotic Bos Bolsonaro's, uh, Bolsonaro's followers is that the China uh, send this virus to control the world, that it could invert the gender, the sex of gender of the person. But if inverted, it was not going to stay as it was. You know, everybody was going to become gay was to destroy the Western family. If we put that in the past, we find a very similar thing. The, the idea that the foreigner is the destroyer that of what you have, the Christians will disappear. So the, the Jews were going to take over. But the idea of the contagious for what I have read is this idea is very, very old. It comes from the antiquity. 
in the pharaonic uh, uh, Egypt, it was present in uh, this is present building up the idea of contagious that we have today. Uh, today we we identify what's the virus, but uh, you pre there are preconizations of the same things of the past. And also the answers and the reactions are the same from thousands of years ago. It's very interesting that how after thousands of the year, we have the permanence of certain archetypes, including in the universe of the science, the theory of the contagion as you said, is very persistent and it's not new. It again, uh, again, you know, uh, like a dress up as a very technical thing. I was thinking about this question. Um, you talked about that the disease as a mom that Christians and gypsies are attacked in Europe. I was articulating with the, the notion of ration, nation and race. In, uh, I think the Arabic word is also, is, it happens at more or less at the same time which is this idea of, uh, and that happens around that big, big outbreak of the, of the plague. We have this true case of the gypsies and the Jews are very obvious because these are two communities that use different languages who have praxis, today very dissolved in the in the daily life but among them they they have this practice but uh, today is much more private today you only recognize who is gypsy particularly for the dresses of the women but in the past they used their language in the public and everything and these are peoples without territory so they are nations without being states. They are cultural nations without being states. They are an errant uh, nomad. So it, it goes against the medieval idea of my field, my territory, my servants, these two national entities, Jews, in the sense of nation as culture, religion, etc., these cannot fit in this stagnated model. What is going to be the national state that has a language, a border, and a king? So it comes from the fields, and uh, it's part of the contemporary national states. So this is one of the things that uh, that happened uh, that the France, the, the French Revolution, for example, they prohibit the, the, the learning and the taught of other languages that would not be the, the French. So they, they do not, there is only the language of the Ile de France that's the capital Paris. So the languages that were present there, they are, they are uh, prohibited. Okay, so if you're not part of the language of that culture that, so the, the, the church comes with, the, uh, they do the same with all the heresies. The idea of forming the one Bible that is canon, 
that is one only voice, one only text, one only possibility. All the others are deviating from this. I realize now the, the, the question done by Angelo, he didn't see the answer. So he's going to repeat. So he says that's a very good elaboration about Europe. Uh, and he wants to know about the world, the Suahili world and the Lagoa Bay. And Zamparoni had already said that this is, is going to be in the Thursday class. Okay. One interesting that thing that you said now, Zampa, this magical aspect of the bio biomedicine. We have only four minutes now. I don't know if you are going to talk about this the next classes, the possibility itself that we think that uh, the vaccine can insert a chip in, in one purse, it brings the idea of what people, how people, how the population understand the, the vaccine and a, a, a chip, you know, so, so we can think that this universe of communication. This is also intangible in a remote time. The communications happen through a tangible object. So the paper, the letter, a tangible object that will bring it. So the uh, telephone changed that. You talk it. We talked to the people. We were, you were present first, and then the letter that you were not present, but was the letter was a tangible, and then the telephone. Although you had an intermediary, you were not close to the person. So many people thought that it was magic. Some people was skeptical about the possibility that was that other person in the other side. So the universe of communication also deals with that. What it uh, really um, uh, caught my attention when I read this medicine books of the past and uh, thank you to this Google that is allowing this by digitalizing book of the antiquity. The majority of these books are some European, French, English, some German, some Italian in the European, in the European world, but also allows us to have this possibility to realize how close we are of such a, a distant past. We as historians in other situations, we, we feel that, but historians, we look for specificity because we think that certain things happen uh, due to certain very spiff, very specific conditions that are not are not possible of being repeated. They are performed. And that's why dramaturgy that people think uh, that somebody brought is a performance that happens, is a performance in these terms that can be totally untangible. People are not conscious that this is a is a performance, but the the rituals, the way that things happen, it looks like that is a repetition. Even the the way that the characters speak look like they are taken from this distant university from centuries ago. 
it, and it's not only the 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 speeches of this these characters like the pastors that repeat things from uh, books that were written uh, centuries. But even people who did not have any involvement with the Bible, but they bring speeches and arguments. And, and uh, this has to is repeated from books that I'm reading from the 16th century, 15th century, the narrative that I, some of the narratives I mentioned in the past, these are astonishing, really. But for the historians, it's even shocking in some ways that the specificity in the humanity is less specific than we imagine. For me, I found out when I when you work with Africa, particularly, you realize that there are things that are present in several different peoples, which are not uh, really got from each other. This idea. I think for the time we're closing now, I want to say, if you have questions, it's still you can bring in the next class. And these themes are interconnected. The two next classes, they are going to be demonstrations of some of the things that we mentioned here in different contexts. So Thursday, OK? Thank you very much. I, I, I also want to Thank, and I pass the floor to William. Professors, your professors, very good to be here with you. I'm looking forward for the two next classes. I want to thank you for the generosity of being here with so much knowledge. I'm uh, sure that we're going to have much more in the next two classes. I want to Thank all the team that involved with the Fabrica. Thank you very much. See you Thursday, 10 a.m. And we already solved the technical problem and then it's going to be punctually. I'll be ready. Okay, see you. I invite all of you who are here to invite others. See you Thursday. Thank you.